I guess I wanted to start off and talk a little bit or ask you guys about just conceptually the whole idea of con artists. And I guess, Maria, I'll, I'll start with you since you've been doing so much thinking and writing in this area. But I feel like people in general find the whole idea of a con artist to be just like really fascinating. We see it come up in pop culture and media. And I'm, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you think that is, why are people so interested in the con man, and what, what is the psychological profile of that type of personality? Sure, sure. Um, I think that just the very, the very na term con artist, by the way, um, artist, right? I think that that gives you a hint as to why people are so incredibly fascinated by them. Because they're, and this is not my expression, it comes from David Moore's 1940 book, The Big Con, which I recommend to everyone. He called them the aristocrats of crime. Um, and I think that that is so incredibly apt because unlike other criminals, they often don't even break the law. They do not ask you for anything. You give it to them. It's not like they come into your house and they steal money. You want to give them your money. You want to give them your trust. The term confidence man comes from giving your confidence, your trust to someone else. There was a guy who used to walk the streets of New York. This is the first known use of this term in the 1800s. And he would say, have you confidence in me to lend me your watch until tomorrow? Um, and, and people would give him their watches because, because it was such an incredibly, you know, it, it talks a, a lot about the kind of person you are, the kind of worldview you have, you know, do you trust other people? There's so, I mean, it's such a loaded question. When he was finally caught, he had lots and lots of watches <laughs> on him. And so confidence, man, have you confidence in me? Um, and I think that that's so, what's so fascinating about them. We give them everything that they want. I mean, think about Bernie Madoff, right? One of the most famous con artists of our time. People begged for years to have him take their money. They stood at the door, they said, Bernie, please. And he would say no, he'd turn people away. He'd make them beg for a really long time. And when he finally took your money, he said, oh my god, thank you so much. Take more. Please take more. Um, and I think that that's a very common occurrence. And that's what's so fascinating. They're, we don't see them as criminals. We see them, see them as someone with a much softer touch. Now, once again, you, talked about this, you asked me to talk about the psychological profile. When you go into that, it becomes scary. Um, so a lot of con artists have some or all of the dark triad of traits. Again, not my term, although I wish I'd come up with it. Um, and that's psychopathy, narcissism, and, my, and Machiavellianism. Psychopathy, lack of empathy, lack of emotion. They say that they understand you, but they don't actually experience any emotion. And so for you, um, to, to them, you are a mark. That's their term for victims. It's not a victim, it's a mark. I mean, that's, you're a walking target. You're a thing, you're not a human being. Um, narcissist, it's not just about ego, it's about entitlement. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not taking anything from you. I'm writing the world. I'm taking what belongs to me. It's rightfully mine. I write about people who steal PhDs, MDs, all of these things because they say, hey, I'm smarter than a PhD. Why do I need to go and get one? I'm just going to take it um, because I deserve it more. It's mine. And Machiavellianism, I think, goes to that ar aristocrats of crime. Those are the soft skills of persuasion. They're able to manipulate us and we don't know we're being manipulated. No one likes being manipulated. The second you think that you're being manipulated, you balk. You say, hey, why am I doing this? They excel at making you think that everything is coming from you, that you're not being manipulated, that it's all about your free will, even though they've planted every seed of the idea in your mind. And it's actually beautiful when you watch them work. They're doing horrible things and they're horrible people, but there's artistry to their craft. I mean, it's really a high art to be able to convince so many people to live in your world, to believe in your story. Awesome. Uh, you know, um, Vinny, I wonder about, you know, in your, in your world as a magician and a mentalist, you're often deceiving people, and we hear you know, th about the dark triad of these traits. <laughs> Any of that stuff sound familiar? I mean, what's the difference between what you do and uh, the type of people Maria, what we were talking about? Speaking of narcissists, Vinny, um, <laughs> we, um, <laughs> the difference is what I do is uh, mine ends at theater, right? Uh, I don't, uh, I'm not taking anything other than your attention for, for a little bit. Um, and, and that's, that's the main difference, is, is that some, is a con artist is doing it for survival. Um, uh, they're also doing it for enjoyment, but I'm strictly doing it for enjoyment for the audience and myself. Yeah. 
great. Yeah. And, and I guess the same question I would have for, for Steve and Mike, I mean, we all watch, you know, Mad Men and so forth, uh, you know, in the world of persuasion, professional persuasion, what kind of overlap is there between, you know, the, the, the three card money expert and, and the, uh, the, the master of persuasion in the marketing world and how, you know, what are your thoughts on that Venn diagram, if you will? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I think um, one of the things that we emphasize and that's really important, I think, is to make sure that, that everybody who participates in one of our cons or one yeah. of our forgeries is, is a willing participant in that. And I think there's a very interesting psychology in the participation in a, in a seat, whether it's an audience member or whether it's somebody in a con. You know, I read these stories about people who, who uh, even museums who believe they may have a forged painting, but there's kind of, they sometimes they don't even admit it, even to themselves, they don't want to admit it. There's this theory that you know a large percentage of paintings in, in museums are, all, are forged, but nobody knows which ones. And I think in some, in some ways, as a participant in that, whether it's a willing participant or an unwilling participant, I think the role of, 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 how m of what you're willing to believe. Mm -hmm. We were talking backstage about, I'm always amazed at how many people are, um, um, on my Facebook feed, uh, believe onion stories, <laughs> and share those onion statements, and I'm like, I don't, what, why? And, and and that's a very clear cut example. There's also an awful lot of stories out there that are hoaxes, that are false news, especially with the current political cycle, and it and and uh, and it and that's the psychology of why people participate in deception, what their role is in that deception as well, because. My experience is that people tend not to read those articles. They just share them, and they share them if it reaffirms what they already believe. I already believe this. It must be true, so I will share it out. So there's a lot of that, but I think in that, you have to question at that point the, the role of the audience as much as the role of the, of the deceivers. Yeah, um, I, let me just chime in there and say one of the things that I find is that um, the best con artists of, of our own minds are ourselves. You know, con artists only have to do so much work. We do so much of the work for uh, for them because we want to believe. I mean, I think there's a very fundamental human need for meaning and for, for beliefs that kind of reaffirm our sense of the world and of our place in it. And con artists really feed into that. Um, mm. I draw a parallel between organized religion um, and how con artists work because they feed into the same human desire for for a life to mean something, for events to happen for a reason. Um, and I think that constant quest for explanation and meaning, our deep discomfort with uncertainty, um, with ambiguity, with things that don't make sense, um, that's the con artist's bread and butter. And that, I think, is one of the reasons we love magic um, and one of the reasons why you know, people, your marketing campaigns are so successful. Um, because we, we actually like being deceived. No one wants to see the world the way it really is. <laughs> um, so, so let me give you a, a, a fun fact or not so fun fact. All of you here um, have an optimistic bias about yourself. You think that you're slightly better looking, slightly <laughs> smarter, slightly better at everything good about yourself, um, and slightly less bad at anything bad about yourself than you actually are. And this bias is incredibly psychologically beneficial. Um, the only people who don't have it, who actually end up being accurate on self-assessments, are the clinically depressed. <laughs> so that, that, <laughs> That shows you that's that's a, that's a, a very substantial body of psychology um, behind that statement, not just be me being funny. <laughs> um, but that shows you just how valuable that is. But con artists sell you that ver that version of the world that's not actually true because our version is already a little flawed. It's already optimistic. Um, one other thing I thought would be interesting for us to touch upon was you know, the idea of, of avoiding victimhood, perhaps. So I know you talked in the beginning about how we, we all fall for it, right? And I would imagine, I know I don't want to fall for it. I think probably everyone here doesn't want to fall for it. It would be great to get some thoughts on how can we avoid falling for it? So I was thinking maybe, you know, Vinny, in your world, if you could, if you have any thoughts about uh, the kinds of techniques that you use to kind of trick people um, in your world. <laughs> I don't know, maybe there's a more, a better term for it, to, to entertain people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how, how people can kind of get a leg up on right. getting ahead of the game. And sleep. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, um, I can't, I, I unfortunately can't tell you the, the <laughs> techniques that, that I use, but um, they're meant to be kept secret. But what I can say is that 
um, what you can, I guess, learn from from magic is that no matter who you are, Maria was talking about this, this a little bit, it's like you you can be manipulated. Your thoughts can be manipulated. You can be conned. Um, um, it has to do with this bias. I mean, I don't have that bias, but um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but I think that's what everyone thinks coming into a magic show uh, or a mentalism show. They there's the alpha males that come in with their arms crossed and they go, you know, read my mind. And, mm -hmm. and I have to try to undo that, in, not in an aggressive way, but just sort of kind of lure them in and, and sort of just relax that part of their, their mind and then, and then go from there. But, uh, but yeah, anyone can be, can be manipulated, if you will. Yeah. And then what about, you know, for you guys, when you're trying to like persuade, persuade someone, for example, you know, what's, what, what, are the, what are some of the things that you think about? Well, I mean, there's a... You know, advertising is hard because uh, there are no real regulations for the most part. I mean, outside of making very, very specific wrongful claims, mm -hmm. uh, you're pretty much free to do anything, which really puts the, I don't know, the, the moral and ethical issues on the people making something. Um, for us, uh, uh, we, don't, we don't win if we're trying to fool you, right? You, you see things like, uh, to, you know, you look at Reddit as a community, and they exist to do nothing but debunk. It seems like. So if we're trying to tell a story about Game of Thrones and we, or, 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 or Hunted or whatever, and we put it out there and we try to backtrack and make it feel, you know, try to make a hoax, it's, the conversation turns to debunking it, in which case we've lost the story. So um, for us, we're always looking to ride that line and oftentimes make sure there's a tell or a wink there that lets people know that you're playing with them. I mean, this is something that P.T. Barnum kind of really figured out a long time ago that people were fine, as you said, being hoaxed or like going to sideshows and seeing uh, fake acts like the, the woman who turns into a gorilla. You know that's not real, but you pay your dollar and you go in and you love that, that you saw it and that it's not real. I think there's a little bit of that, that you kind of have to make sure you're, you're conveying that little bit of we're playing here and it's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, that said, how do you avoid that if from, from uh, less scrupulous marketers who might be trying to, to sucker you in? I, that's a good question because the truth is, is there's a, the whole range exists in the field. It's, it's funny, as you were kind of talking about, you know, gi giving people permission to kind of buy into the story uh, just as an aside. So when I was a kid, I was obsessed with professional wrestling. Like, I just was like totally into professional wrestling. And the most annoying thing when you're a kid and you're into professional wrestling is like, your uncle comes into the room and says, you know, like, you know it's fake, right? <laughs> It's like, yeah, of course I know it's fake, but like Hamlet's fake, Macbeth is fake, but you still enjoy it, right? So like, get off my case. So I hear, I hear what you're saying, I identify with that. It's so annoying. Um, <laughs> you know, actually, I might, I'm gonna pause really quickly. Are there any, any questions from the audience so far that anybody would wanna ask? Uh, yes. Oh, uh, this is for uh, Steve and Mike. Um, and it's about one specific movie, and if you have no opinion, move on to something else, I guess. But uh, is it fair to say that the monster movie Cloverfield, which has a sequel coming out this month, uh, tried to replicate the Blair Witch a viral marketing campaign, but kind of got it wrong in that the viral marketing campaign was all H.P. Lovecraft conspiracy occult stuff, and the movie is basically just a Godzilla movie with a big monster stomping on the city, so that if you see the viral campaign, you wouldn't necessarily predict what the movie's like, and if you see the movie, you might not remember that the viral marketing campaign was all Lovecraftian. So the question was uh, to comment on uh, the, the Cloverfield 8 film, in the short version. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean to, for me, this, and you might have a different opinion, but the short version for me is that, uh, you know, it, when you're doing something like that in advance, it should come from the world. I mean, that it should come from the movie, and if you engage with it online, you should get a real sense of, oh, I like this, so I will like the movie. I mean, at the end of the day, if you put something out there that makes people really happy and it has nothing to do with the, the movie or TV show they're gonna watch, they're just gonna hate the movie or TV show and you failed at, at your responsibility of finding, you know, for us when we put those stories out there, in many ways, they're, uh, you're, we're specifically trying to attract a certain audience. So to launch True Blood, for example, we needed to go after horror fans, people who love vampire fiction and, and stories. So you're kind of, you're, you're really going after those people who are most predisposed to enjoy what it is you're, you have on offer. Um, and I think if you're not doing that, then you are wasting your money. Any, uh, any other questions for now? Uh, yes, sir. Um, yeah. uh, for you with, with the, uh, the beautiful oh. mustache. Oh. <clears throat> In the world of confidence, would you say that 
that the, the greed of the victim was the motivation for the whole confidence game. Is that a question for Maria? Okay, so a question for everyone is, is greed a key motivator for falling for scams, essentially? Um, so let me answer and say absolutely not. Um, I think that greed oftentimes has absolutely nothing to do with it. So let me give you an example of one of the single most prevalent scams right now, which is the sweetheart scam. Um, you go on a dating website, you find the love of your life, um, you find an emotional connection, you've really found someone who understands you, you have a long relationship with them. Suddenly they need money for a surgery, you give them money. Um, they need this, you give them more money. They need a visa, you give them more money. Um, they're coming to visit you, you give them more money. Your bank account's drained, they suddenly disappear um, because they never existed, it was all false. It's not, about, it's not about greed. At that point, you're wiped out and you never expected a return. It was all about human connection. And I think a lot of times it's such a mis misperception. It really, it actually really upsets me that people think that victims are all motivated by greed. That's one specific victim and one specific con. Most con artists are not motivated by money. They're motivated by power. A lot of con artists make zero dollars. Most of the con artists I write about in the book make nothing from their cons and would have actually made a much better living in a legitimate profession. What gets them going, what gets their juices flowing um, is that sense of power over other people, that you can manipulate people's lives and that you have that control over them. It's actually really disturbing and a lot of them end up having multiple opportunities to go straight don't take them because it's like an addict. You know, that rush of getting away with it um, is too much for them to resist. And so they end up taking, you know, not taking lucrative opportunities to keep doing exactly what they're doing because they love deception. I think, I think we need to get rid of that misconception that it's all about money. Uh, uh, yes, uh, along the, the wall there. It's awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, I'm offering classes starting tomorrow <laughs> evening um, to sign up. It's just $1,500 for the initial lecture, um, and I'll, I'll give you the account to which you can wire the money, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get you guys started. <laughs> and the question was how to, how to become a con man. Like how, how, do you, how, so, how do you get in this game with, for those that aspire to uh, con artistry? Right, so you take my course, and then, and then the, <laughs> there you are is the answer. No, um, there, there is no con artist academy. Um, and <laughs> there are lots of academies run by con artists. <laughs> That's a different thing. <laughs> so, so there are there are um, there are apprentices. There are, that does happen. Um, oftentimes, con artists do work in teams, um, and the inside man is usually the most important part of the con and the oldest. And then you train people specifically for different roles, and then you kind of grow up through the grift, and a lot of them know each other. I actually was able to interview a lot of con artists by finding one, and then I kind of <coughs> got introduced to others through networks. But a lot of them work by themselves. Um, and a lot of it is just an intuitive kind of, they get better over time, they learn about human psychology, they learn how to do what they do. Um, many of them have never finished high school in terms of formal education. Um, almost all of them are formidably intelligent. Um, and so, so I think it's, there are definitely ones that have been trained, but it's not one of those things where everyone goes through a formal <laughs> training and how to be a con artist, except the people who really want to excel. Once again, account number after the show, um, I'll, I'll let you know. So, so for those of us that maybe don't want to go quite so far as becoming a full-fledged con man, but perhaps we're interested in magic, or perhaps we're interested yeah. in the uh, kind of the ad world, the marketing world, you know, how do we how do we get in how do we get into those worlds? What's uh, what, what kind of thoughts about you the aspiring? You just gotta know a guy, you know. <laughs> you just gotta know a guy. Um, yeah, I think I actually think the magic and psychic world are sort of the closest things to. Uh, learning uh, a, a con, <laughs> learning a fraudulent uh, art form, as it were. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, that's... So let me ask you a question, yeah. Vinny. Yeah. Let's talk about Yuri Geller. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because they're... they're How much to time me, do we have? <laughs> 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 no, because I think it's very interesting that, that from 
card cheats and card manipulators to real to real mediums and right. and and uh, magical entertainers who play the part of mediums. Yeah. There's there's, there's a definite crossover, and, uh, and Yuri Geller to me would be one of those examples of somebody that that walks doesn't quite walk the line as finely as he should probably in some uh, cases. Yeah, he. Uh, I, I was talking to Maria about this. I I truly believe that most psychics, including Yuri Geller, uh, are convinced that they they actually possess these abilities. Now, he, he must, I mean, he must know clearly that he is not bending spoons. I mean, we, we I think we're smart people, we know this, right? But a lot of psychics, for instance, get um, a lot of his, hits, right, through, through uh, selective memory of, of their participants, and they start to then convince themselves that they're able to, to get something, uh, tell the future, or talk to the dead. And, in that, you, you have this self-deception and you, you sort of start to create this own, your own world for yourself, you know? Um, and I, I honestly just think Uri Geller is, you know, really deceiving himself. <laughs> I really, I really do. And there's people like James Randi um, and Houdini even, yeah, who, who debunk them. Um, I haven't been much of a, I don't police fraudulent psychics, I don't really spend my time with that, but James Randi, if you've never seen An Honest Liar, the documentary, it's great. Um, he's uh, he's sort of a mastermind at, at debunking those the psychics. Yeah. Um, by the way, I've I've had that experience as well, where one of my best friends growing up, his mother was like this, a psychic, professional psychic, and absolutely she thinks she thinks it's real, and that belief is able to carry over to the people that she takes money from, who I guess believe it's real also, and I think that's. Well, just, how you convince yourself that you actually have psychic powers, I don't know, but it seems to be something that people are, have the ability to do. Yeah, it goes to prove that you know, belief is hardwired. It's like it has the same you know, religious mentality. It's just we want to believe, so yeah. we, we have to latch on to something. That's know? actually a great segue, because I wanted to talk to you guys about just the idea of belief and this kind of emotional need we have to believe, and that's one of the things in your book, Maria, that you talk a lot about and how uh, you know, the con artist really plays into this, this very human need we have to believe something about ourselves or about the world or the way we want our world to be. And I guess I'd be interested in, you know, each of your perspectives, maybe starting with, uh, with you guys, uh, Mike and Steve, you know, when you the role yeah. of belief and emotion in, uh, in the wor mean, your world. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 the power of, of Blair Witch is uh, all about the fact that I think at the end of the day, most of us want to believe that there are forces in the world that affect our lives that we have absolutely no control over. Um, and, and, and so when you see a, a particular like a supernatural horror movie, it kind of reinforces that. Like no matter what you do, no matter how good you are, what kind of person you are, there's stuff out there that's trying to get us. Um, um, and and, and I, I think that's, you know, I, that's, that's just inherent. I mean, it really is people want to believe. I was telling you guys back there that uh, 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 it would be a day after the actors appeared on uh, The Tonight Show and the phones would ring in our office and pick up the phone and say, hello, Hacks and Films, and you know, this movie, you people are terrible. You're profiting off the lives of those children. Um, you know, and, and you kind of go like, they were on Jay Leno last night. Like, they're not dead. They're on the cover of Newsweek. They're fine, <laughs> but still, people want to believe. Yeah, I just you know, it's I think it's just fundamental to yeah. our nature. I, th I think it's also interesting the psychology of groups that believe together. I mean, I think because of the nature of our work um, is about kind of creating fan communities and engaging fan cultures, we're very much students of how people behave in packs, <laughs> uh, especially when they get to you know when they get together and and it's almost like in some cases rational sense just disappears. Uh, it's a good, a good example. Of, uh, I remember uh, like six or eight weeks ago uh, on Facebook, and I spent a lot of time kind of on social media because that's how a lot of our work spreads, just trying to understand the mechanics of what, of what spreads very quickly and why it does. And I woke up one morning and my <coughs> Facebook feed was full of everybody, all my very smart friends posting the same news article, which said that there was a town that had shut down a solar plant because it was stealing all the sunlight. <laughs> and I read all these, and I was like, "That, that, that can't, that can't be true. That, 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 that can't be a village or a town in America that that is that stupid that, that really believes that." So I kind of 
did a little bit of Googling, which the great opportunities we all have that information. And no, it absolutely wasn't true. It was it was a it was a a lie that had, or or, a, or a, not necessarily a hoax, but a version of events been perpetrated by one particular media. But but everybody was just because it reaffirmed their opinion that there's a you know some parts of America they're really stupid. Yeah. <laughs> they they would immediately repeat that and push that out again, and that in, and that reinforced the truthiness right. of the lie. So you know, just just rational thought is very easy when you're on your own, but when you're in a pack, it's much more difficult, as we'll probably find out in the next six months, right? I feel like you see that in a lot of the the political satire sites as well, right, where people just believe any kind of thing that you see. Maria, before you get yeah, and um, so so going back to the individual. Um, I mean, we as human beings kill for good stories. You know, we, we really love good stories and good storytelling. So I'm a writer and I'm also a journalist. So I do, you know, some investigative work and, you know, follow, follow stories. And you see a lot of times, even within our profession, um, where the mantra is trust but verify, which I think should be kind of something that, going back to your question, how can you protect yourself? Have that be, you know, embalmed <laughs> um, on on your on your mind, saying, you know, trust but verify. Do Google, you know, do the Google. Um, figure out, figure out, you know, is this true? Push the boundaries. You see it not happening all the time because people want that good story. I don't know how many of you remembered um, a few years ago there was a story about this brilliant uh, New York teenager who had made, I don't remember how much money, uh, millions of dollars doing personal trading, um, and all these hedge funds were after him because he was so brilliant. False. <laughs> this guy, this guy, it was a total, totally not true. This ran in New York Magazine. Um, wow. Rolling Stone, the huge cover story on rape, um, where reporters, they, they're not trying to to be false, they're not trying to perpetrate a false story, but they get caught up in the story themselves because they're so, I think the number one step, and I think this is, goes back to what you guys were saying, is you have to be, you have to get their emotions going. Once people are emotionally invested in a story, logic kind of goes out the window. What did you do to those kids? <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things where you stop verifying because you want to believe it so much. And then you think you've verified because your burden of proof, just as it should be rising, starts falling. Um, so you're, you're a mentalist. And um, my first book was about Sherlock Holmes um, and Arthur Conan Doyle. And I, you know, the whole book is about, you know, rational thinking and deduction and kind of this beautiful character that Conan Doyle creates. And then the final chapter is about how Conan Doyle fell for spiritualism and fell for a hoax of fairies. The Cottingley Fairies was, was hoaxed by two teenage girls. Actually, they weren't even teenagers at the time. Um, they, were, they were small children. And you see these pictures that fooled him, and you think, oh my god, Arthur Conan Doyle, are you insane? <laughs> <laughs> but from his, you know, his, he thought that he'd done his due diligence. Um, he thought that he'd actually covered his basis. He wanted to believe in the existence of fairies so much that for him what constituted proof fell, even though he thought he was being incredibly rational. His will to believe in that version of events was so strong that it overpowered everything else, made a fool of him. I mean, he, he wrote this book, The Coming of the Fairies, <laughs> and he published a big article in um, some of the leading magazines in London, including The Strand, and I think that that just goes to show just when we should be more skeptical is when we end up being less skeptical. Yeah, and it's, it's also why, um, you know, if you know somebody who, you know, uh, whatever thinks uh, doesn't vaccinate their children or you know buys into all these things um, when you try to make a rational case to them it only pushes them further into it because they are not coming at it from a rational point of view it's pure emotion right. Minnie, I'm curious from from your perspective uh, when you're doing your act do you ever find people whose desire to believe is so strong that they you know they can't even tell the difference between a magic act and uh... yeah um, I I yeah, I have an advantage, which is that people are buying a ticket to my show, and they, we're sort of signing that theatrical contract. We're saying, what you're seeing is real-ish, fake-ish, you know, in that sort of... I, I, I try to blur the line uh, as much as I can. But uh, my last show that I did called Charlatan um, was all about self-deception and deception. And, and 
I, in it, I did an expose. I did that piece, the alias piece, which is, has nothing to do with microexpressions at all. Uh, I never say that it does, in fact. I just talk about Paul Ekman and then do this, right? Sorry. Um, but, <laughs> but people come up to me after and they're just like, wow, microexpressions, that's amazing. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, it totally is. It really is amazing. Um, so because I'm using a myriad of techniques, um, psychology, suggestion, social, uh, sociology, and deception magic, uh, I'm blurring lines. And I think that's a good thing because it's entertaining, but also it's a bad thing because as much as I tell people that, people still come up to me after and go, no, you're just telling us that so we don't think about, I'm like, I'm not double bluffing you. <laughs> That's ridiculous. But yeah, there's a, there is um, a, one quick story. Uh, when I had my show Charlatan, there was, uh, at the end of that effect that I do, I put up uh, this mug shot, it used to be a mug shot sign, and I had a number underneath it. And the number was 2043. And every night I do the joke, do you know what 2043 goes? And the person goes, I have no idea. And I go, it's actually the year you're going to die. Thank you very much. And I walk him <laughs> off stage. And one night, this woman, she was like completely thrown off by that. <laughs> Clearly a joke. Uh, went back to her seat, looked at me like this the rest of the show. <laughs> Stayed after. Uh, talked to my stage manager. My stage manager would not let me come out. She was like, this woman's insane. She thinks that, she, her, her logic is you were right about everything else. So you're right about the, and I'm like, I gave her ample time. She has at least 20 years. <laughs> to, I mean, um, but eventually we had to show her the script and say, no, this is in the script every <laughs> night. And this is, uh, so there are people who like truly just, yeah, they, can, they have to latch on to it. Amazing. <laughs> and we, we've accounted that, right? We, well, for the, for the, um, for the marketing campaign for Byzantium security that we showed, we actually, that led you down a rabbit hole to a site called Byzantium Tests that purported to test to see eventually if you were the right material for joining Byzantium security. <laughs> and, and, and it started with a, a faux personality test. And it was, it was incredible, it was so random, random images with fragmented questions and you had to choose one of the answers. And you went through this 20 questions. And at the end, we provided people with uh, a personality profile based on their responses. And we used a thing called the Fora effect, uh -huh. which is what, which is what um, uh, astrologers use, right, and magicians yeah. use. Uh, uh, statements that feel very specific to you, but are very general. Um, and I think people knew, because, because we got a lot of response online, and a lot of people were saying this, I absolutely know it's fake, but it's the most accurate reading <laughs> I've ever had. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, those uh, are Barnum statements too, right? Like just well, yeah. The four or five. The four or five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. So I think we have time for maybe a couple more uh, audience questions. Uh, yes, you sir in the front. Um, so looking to draw across, uh, <laughs> looking to draw across uh, commonalities. Um, one of the elements I see as necessary for a good con or a magic show or maybe the art um, is is the desire, the wants to believe. That's a, a key element. Another key element that I see is um, asymmetry of information, that there's one party in the exchange that has more information than another, and that's an essential element. If it's a, if it's a, if it's a flat exchange of ideas, it's not going to quite work as a con or as a magic actor and so forth. I'm wondering if you could address other commonalities to the work that the three of you do, if you can identify anything else that you would say is necessary for the work that you so the question was the commonalities between the three spheres of our guests, so magic, uh, just con artistry in general, and uh, marketing. So, well, I'll, I'll give you two. I'll Still give making. you two right away. Um, one is storytelling, um, con artists, magicians, and um, filmmakers, advertisers. They're all really exquisite storytellers. A lot of magic um, is not about sleight of hand. Um, some of the best magicians are not the best sleight of hand artists. It's about telling the best story because that's the other commonality. So talking about um, the other thing that I was going to say they have in common, manipulation of attention. These are people who, you, who can actually draw your attention to the things that they want to draw your attention to um, and who can get it in a very specific way. And stories are a wonderful way to do that. Yeah, I was also going to say vulnerability is also is a huge thing. Um, uh, I have, uh, there's, some, there's an idea that I 
try to focus on, which is that my audience is vulnerable when they come to my show because I go out into the audience, I pick people on stage. Um, that's, that's not great for a lot of people. People don't like to be called up on stage. Um, and, and so m my character has to be vulnerable as well so that they trust me. And I think that's uh, part, in part what a confidence man does. And, and also in marketing, I think you have to kind of be on the same level as the person in order to build Def their trust. Definitely with marketing, think it's getting closer together. I mean, there was a time when advertising was about right. was, was broadcast, TV spots going out there. But I think one of the commonality right. now that, that, that technology is powering, is it about, about being conversation, being a back and forth? I mean, right. uh, magic is about reading the audience and responding to that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure a con is about, about sensing and then shifting and moving. And, and in a way, the work we do as well is similar to that. We will put something out, we will watch where an audience reacts, and we'll immediately respond to that and change and adapt to that. So it's very much a back and forth uh, relationship. Absolutely. It's performance. Uh, you know, in a way, I mean, I mean con men and, and magicians uh, are, are performers. But I think, you know, um, advertisers traditionally work in media. And I think what happens now is the approach that we've been taking towards the media is as performance rather than as kind of fixed media. And so that brings, I think, what we do very specifically much closer to, um, to you know, what, what you're doing or what, a, unfortunately, a con man does. <laughs> <laughs> So let's do one more. I think there was someone waving their cell phone in the back there. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> So, <laughs> just quickly, so the, quick sleep. No, just so the question was, uh, <laughs> so it, we think of con men as being kind of an antiquated Victorian thing, uh, you know, how does it exist in the, in the world today, right? Yeah. Um, well, I think that it's much more prevalent today than it, than it ever was, um, because every single new technology is a new arena for con artists to play, so someone earlier mentioned the movie The Sting. Um, that was based on the wire, wire fraud, which was introduced the moment the telegraph was introduced. Um, the moment the telephone was introduced, we got fraudulent phone calls. Um, the moment the internet was introduced, well, hello. <laughs> you know, so, so, many, so many scams online. Um, but I think one of the reasons that we still see it as an antiquated thing is the principles haven't changed. You know, it's still the same exact game as it was hundreds of years ago. Let me give you an example, the 419 Nigerian email scam that you mentioned. Spanish prisoner, around since at least the 1500s, the original Spanish prisoners, there's a Spanish prisoner. He's very, very wealthy. If you give a little bit of money towards his bail, towards helping him um, get out of jail because he's being held in a foreign country, he'll share his treasure with you because he's going to be so incredibly grateful. Same exact thing that we have with the Nigerian you know, scam, wire us a little bit of money, but it's the principles are the same. And we also, because we glamorize them so much in our culture and we have all of these movies about them, I think a lot of people see them and think, you know, hats and three-piece suits. Um, not, not to say that three-piece suits aren't the government. <laughs> 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 But I think that <laughs> I'm feeling a little sleepy. Was there? <laughs> um, so, so I think that that's that's also part of it. And the final part of it is that we don't want to think it can happen to us. And the further in the past we can place it, the less of a threat it is. I, I think also. Um, just to build off that is that a lot of the con artists now are faceless, right? I mean, that's that the idea of, you know, the, the archetype of the magician is the top hat and tails and all that. And, we, and we've seen other magicians do the opposite. We've seen Penn and Teller and we sort of, we get that, right? But but with the con man, it's because a lot of the new cons are, are faceless people. We don't have a new archetype for what, for what that is. So 
Um, I, the first thing that comes to mind, <laughs> it's me. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is is um, uh, Neve Shulman, um, Catfish, right? That's mm -hmm. that that whole thing. That is a that was a con artist. I mean, in I mean, even though I don't think she wanted money or anything, but but she you know was conning someone. I mean, that's that's a faceless con right there. So mm -hmm. anyway. Well, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you all for coming out tonight.